Our next speaker is the director of the Georgia Tech Brain Lab. And we're going to take a little look at what it, our brains are actually capable of, which will be shocking to you, I think, um, because her work is revolutionary um, and astounding. So join me in welcoming Melody Moore Jackson to the TEDx Atlanta stage. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Well, I uh, have just been in awe all day of these amazing educators and innovators. And as an educator myself, I am just so honored to be in this group. And I, as I, I saw my, my daughter's uh, school's headmaster here from Westminster and my husband's school's headmaster, David, uh, from GAC, and my daughter's very favorite teacher of all time is here. It's like, well, how did I get included in this group? Um, and I figured it out. Every TED event has to have a geek. <laughs> and I am the token geek. And actually, I'm okay with that. Because at Georgia Tech, we pride ourselves on producing geeks. So, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about relearning, but in a very different way than what you've heard so far, which everything we've heard so far has excited me a lot. Uh, but we are going to look at relearning in a very neurological sense. So I'll apologize for the geekness. Uh, but uh, I am the director of the Brain Lab at Georgia Tech. And uh, for a moment, I want you to imagine being completely paralyzed and unable to speak. You're breathing through a ventilator. A machine is breathing for you. And you can't move. You can't communicate but your mind is completely intact. You can think, you can hear, you can see, and worst of all, you can still feel. And this is a syndrome called locked-in syndrome. Half a million people worldwide are in this situation. This is uh, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Neil Browerman. Has anybody had LASIK surgery in this room? He was one of the pioneers of the LASIK technique. He was a retinal surgeon. Uh, and you have him to thank and some of his colleagues for that technique today. He was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, in his 40s and became completely paralyzed. And we worked with him for many, many years. We lost him a couple of years ago. But for people like Neil and many, many others, half a million other people, we are very interested in developing assistive technologies that don't require any kind of muscle movement to be able to improve their quality of life. So um, the Brain Lab's mission uh, is to study direct brain interfaces, being able to control devices, not just computers, but lots of different devices, directly from the brain signal. And so when people find that out, they say, wow, can you read my mind? And I always say, yes, I can. <laughs> And they back slowly out of the room. And that is sort of true and sort of not true. Um, we can not detect certain thoughts. I can't tell if you're thinking about Pamela Anderson or whoever it is these days. Um, I can't tell that. But we can tell if you have voluntarily made minute changes in your brain signal with different thought patterns. And I'm going to tell you all about what those thought patterns are. Uh, but this allows us to detect those voluntary changes and we can allow you to control devices in the environment. So the mission of the Brain Lab is to take these technologies, which have actually been studied in the labs uh, for 20, 25 years. This is not brand new technology, although it may sound like science fiction. And there are certainly some science fiction books written about this, if you've read Neuromancer or Snow Crash. Um, those things are not so far off from what we uh, should be able to do soon. Uh, but uh, we want to take these things out of the laboratory, put them in people's hospital rooms, put them in, the lab, in, in people's homes, so that they are being used in the real world. So that's the mission of the Brain Lab. Uh, we want to be able to pioneer these technologies for people with severe physical disabilities. And if we happen to stumble across some things that work for mainstream, such as gamers, then that's great too, but our main mission is for assistive technology. So, uh, what can you do with these things? 
So, oh, gosh, I can control things by thinking about it. That sounds cool. Maybe I'll control a hovercraft. It's not quite that easy to do. Uh, the kinds of things that we do with uh, direct brain interfaces essentially is uh, to bypass the inter intermediaries like a mouse or a keyboard and give you direct control over a device with, a, uh, with just your brain signal. The most important thing that we study is restoring communication. Because if you can imagine being locked in, completely locked in, a prisoner in your own body, the worst thing that can happen to a human being is to be completely out of control of, of anything, to not be able to tell your caregiver that you're in pain. So if we can restore communication, we can actually give these folks a decent quality of life. And one of my colleagues, Niels Bierbaumer, in Germany, did a study of completely locked in people, and as long as they could communicate, they actually had a pretty good quality of life and they weren't depressed. So that's really important. We want to restore communication. The next most important thing is to provide them the independence of mobility, to be able to drive a wheelchair, to be able to move around at will. Um, then the third thing, which is fairly new and very exciting, is can we actually change the brain? Can we actually rehabilitate people who have had strokes, who may not be able to move? Can we change that? So actually using a direct brain interface to rewire the brain, and we'll talk about that last. So in order for you to, to really grasp what I'm going to tell you, I've got to give you a little tutorial. I'm a, I apologize, I'm a professor. We're prone to lecture. I'm sorry. That's what we do. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about brain signal detection techniques, and there are quite a few out there. Uh, we're lucky that Georgia Tech and Georgia State have an fMRI magnet, but it doesn't tend to be very portable. It weighs several tons. So the only thing I'm going to tell you about today are our portable uh, devices that we use, and there are two of them. Um, the first one is called functional near-infrared imaging, and this is a very small, very simple device. We have several that we have uh, uh, put together uh, that, uh, that we're distributing to our um, patients and our participants in our studies right now. But the FNIR device is, is uh, based on an infrared light shining into the brain, very simple, can be put on by a nurse or a caregiver. The other one is something you might have uh, had experience with yourself clinically, uh, is the EEG or the electroencephalograph. Um, this is something that neurologists use all the time, and it's electrodes on the scalp, and I'll give you a little more detail about how these things work. So how does a functional near-infrared system work? Well, the one that we're using right now, very simple, it's a simple headband with a little emitter. You see that little dot of light up there? That is a light that's coming out in an infrared spectrum, and we choose that for uh, boring technical reasons. Um, that infrared light shined, shown, shined into the brain um, can be reflected out, and by what's absorbed by the brain, we can tell how active the brain is at that point in the brain. So it sort of looks like this. We shine the infrared light in. The oxygen in your blood absorbs that light. And by what we can see reflected, we can tell how active your brain is. And you can change that with mental imagery. So that's the way it works. Uh, the, the imagery that we work right here with right here, and my student Maya here is wearing the sensor over her Broca's area, which is the language center, in a right-handed person anyway, uh, which is right about here on your temple. And the way that we activate this thing is by using language imagery, not surprisingly. So if you count silently to yourself, one, two, three, five, six, seven, as fast as you can go, that activates your Broca's area. If you think about singing, I sing the Star Spangled Banner because it's boisterous and reminds me of NASCAR, um, it, it will activate your Broca's area. I, I, I'm a geek and a redneck. Um, <laughs> what can I say? Um, but it activates that Broca's area. Or if you say poetry to yourself. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of our dear subjects that we've worked with for a long time, who's the mother of a young two-year-old, uh, one day was just doing 100%. She was doing so well on this thing. And we said, wow, what are you thinking about today? And she spelled out, she turned all red. She said, I'm thinking of swear words. And so our, our patients, our participants in our studies even come up with their own way of activating their brokers. And so after that, we said, well, you know, hey, whatever works, we don't care. We're not censoring anybody. Uh, but the way this device works is very simple. It allows you to say yes and no. Now, it seems like, oh, gosh, is that all it does? But if you're in pain and somebody says, are you in pain, and you can't say yes or no, this becomes really important. So the way this works is you use your language imagery, and this is a, a somewhat boring picture of, of the, what the researcher sees when this happens. You see that little dip in that little blue wavy line? That's the oxygenation, the oxygen being of the, uh, absorbing the light in, in the person's brain. And we can detect that change um, compared to the one on the right, which is a no. 
Uh, and we know that the person intended to say yes on the left. And so that's, it's, it's fairly simple. There's a lot of complex pattern matching going on in there, but it's fairly simple. Um, and uh, the reason, that the, the task that you have when you say no, you, it's very hard to turn your brain off. This is something we call the Midas touch problem, because you remember the story of King Midas, where everything he touched turned to gold, including his little daughter. Um, you have to give the brain something to do, or it will go off and do language tasks, and then you activate it accidentally. So we have to tell people to think, la, 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 at the speed of their heartbeat. Now that gets boring after a while too, so people have gotten very innovative about what they're thinking to turn it off. So that's a big problem that we have to solve, is how do you turn these things off? So we just are wrapping up one of the largest, I believe the largest study ever done in ALS patients. Uh, we've traveled all over the United States to nine different states, and uh, this device has been in 33 homes, and we're hoping to hit 40 by the end of this month, uh, of, of ALS patients who are using this device to communicate with. And we've asked them, you know, we want you to do yeses and noes, and we want you to do eight of them a session, and as often as you can do it. And we have uh, seen great success with... Uh, success rates of 60 to 100 percent accuracy with this device so we're really excited about the results of this test but the main feedback that we got from them was it's really boring to say yes and no over and over and over and over so we said okay um, we are going to create a game for you so we built this little balloon race game let's see if I can get it to go here I Sorry, they... It's going? I'll leave it alone then. Uh, it's not moving on my screen. Ha, huh, interesting. It's not moving up here. Technology. Um, so the idea here is instead of, of raising your uh, brain signal to say yes, you raise your brain signal to move the little balloon up there, and, and that just hit a power up. So you're trying to hit the good things. You're trying to avoid the bad things like this. And one of the reasons we have the mark so large is that a lot of our patients don't have really good eyesight. So uh, to be able to see, you need to move up and, and get over this thing. So this gives them a way to practice changing their brain signal so that they can communicate better. Um, but the neatest thing about this is this summer we're going to network this so that all of our different participants in the study all over the United States can race each other and they can actually communicate with each other. So our, our uh, folks in Alabama can race the folks in California and actually be in touch with other people that are in their same situation. So that's uh, one of the games uh, my student Wesley St. John invented that for his master's thesis. So that's one of our devices. Now I'll tell you briefly about uh, another device. This is how the EEG itself works. And the EEG is based on electrical activity. As our neurons fire, and we have millions and millions of them firing all at once, sort of like a, lowering a microphone into a stadium and trying to figure out the rules of the game you're watching from the crowd noise. So it's not precise. We're not seeing an individual neuron firing. We're seeing lots of neurons firing at once and trying to figure out what those classification patterns are. So we use a, a cap, as you see my student Luke here wearing, that has uh, electrodes in it and just scalp electrodes. We, have, we put this stinky gel that uh, gives them a good neural connection, a good uh, electrical connection, and then we can measure the electrical activity of the brain. And there are two different, there are actually lots of different things you can do with EEG. I'm going to tell you about two of them today. One of them is based on paying attention to something. So we, we've, we'll show a stimulus, and we can tell by the reaction in your brain to that stimulus what your intent was. The other one is by thinking about something, of course, like moving your hand or rotating a Rubik's Cube. So the first one I'll tell you about is an evoked potential, and this it means that you're paying attention to something. Um, this is a, uh, a reaction in the brain called the steady state visual evoked potential, or the SSVEP. I promise you some geek hood, and there you go. Um, and what we have here, this is an interface that we developed, and these checkerboards actually flash at different rates. And I'm not going to show you that because I'd have to screen you all for epil epilepsy, and we can't do that in the four minutes and 45 seconds we have left. So the bottom one might flash at 10 times a second or 10 hertz. The left one, 15 times a second or 15 hertz, 17 hertz, 20 hertz, etc. And by um, having our user pay attention to one of those flashing boxes. I can tell which one you're looking at or paying attention to in the visual cortex back here in your occipital lobe. We can see that in your brain. You don't have to move your eyes. A lot of my patients can't move their eyes. 
You don't have to move your head. You just have to pay attention to the one that you want to select. So this is a pretty powerful uh, direct brain interface. Right now, it's the fastest one. You can select, make about 10 to 12 selections per minute, which is very, very fast. And we have done something a little bit new with this. A lot of people have used this to spell or to select things with something called discrete selection, so selecting one thing. We are actually driving a wheelchair with it. I have a student named Michael Boyce who just graduated, and he is a wheelchair user. And he had the idea to reverse engineer his own wheelchair to be driven by his brain. And so I said, OK, Michael. And uh, here's Michael. And you can see that the, the four checker boxes are flashing there. Uh, the top one is mapped to going forward. The right one is mapped to going right. The left one left, and the bottom one to stop. And so here is Michael driving his wheelchair. And you can see he's paying attention to the right one. He's turning to the right. Now, you'll notice for a second that he glances away. So this actually is based on his history of where you've been looking. So he can even talk. He can glance away. He can have a life while he's driving his chair, which is a little bit different than some of our other brain computer interfaces take to um, total concentration. So here I've asked him to do a 360. And uh, you'll see him move his hand um, to a controller. I just want to let you know that's a kill switch. It's not a controller. Because I told him I don't want a michael size hole in the wall of my lab. Uh, and he's going to drive it straight towards my other student, who's going to look remarkably relaxed, because Michael's going to have to stop the chair. And it stops. So, uh, so this is something that I'm really proud of Michael for doing. And this is the first time that, that this particular signal has been used in a continuous method, ma manner. Um, the next one I'm going to tell you about very briefly is motor control, direct brain interface. There's a picture of me and my very fashionable electro cap. Um, and motor control is just what it sounds like. We're looking at motor movement or imagined motor movement. And that funky little picture up in the right-hand corner is me from the top of my head. My nose is at the top. You're looking at the top of my head. And that, that big red spot right there is my right-hand motor cortex, which is on the left side of my head. And that's me thinking about doing this. So we can actually detect that. It's like a volume knob. You can turn up the rhythm in your brain that's associated with your motor movements. So you can make it louder. You can make it softer. And of course, we can do a lot of things with that. Um, some colleagues of mine in New York at the Wadsworth Center have, have built a, a speller that works on this. So let's say I wanted to spell my name, Melody. So what I would do is I would think I want to choose the top half of the alphabet there. So what we're going to do is we're going to split the alphabet in half, split it again, split it again, until you get to the letter that you actually want. I'm going to think about moving my hand. This cursor moves across the screen all by itself. And I move it up or down with my motor movement. And people can spell with this. My friend Neil. I showed you the picture of at the beginning of my talk, fired one of his nurses this way because she was sleeping at night. Boy, was she surprised. <laughs> that was one of the pinnacles of my best moments of my career, was when Neil fired his nurse with our brain computer interface. And she's like, what? You know, mm -hmm. All the rest of his staff called him boss after that. So the, one of the most interesting, exciting things that happened in the course of studying this particular uh, brain response is that over time, people would no longer think about moving their hand. They would think about moving the cursor. And I said, wow, this is a uh, phenomenon called neuroplasticity. The brain is actually changing itself to produce the signal that moves the cursor. So um, we are in the process of studying whether or not we can restore movement to stroke patients. So a stroke patient who's paralyzed on one side can't move that side, but they can still think about moving. So we ask them, think about touching that target. Think about touching that target. They can't actually touch it. But we process the brain signal, and then we put them in a rehabilitation robot, as you see here. She is thinking about moving her hand. The robot's moving her hand to the target. So she thinks about moving it. She's controlling her own hand. To, to touch that target. She sees her hand moving. She feels her hand moving. She gets what's called proprioceptive feedback, which is where is your hand in space. And the early results we have from this is it works, that it will allow us to literally rewire the brain to, to allow these folks to regain movement. So very exciting work by my PhD student, Carolyn Babalola. This is her, her PhD dissertation topic. And with that, I am out of time, and I'd like to thank my Brain Lab team. I'd very much like to thank uh, my sponsors, the National Science Foundation, the ALS Association, the Veterans Administration, and Hitachi Japan for their support of the work that I just told you about. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hear Billy play again, so I'm going to sit down and shut up. <laughs>